You will all see that uh, there is uh, a lot more than models and modeling that will be discussed during uh, this uh, session. We have uh, four uh, presentations uh, in the session. Uh, the rules of the game. Each of our uh, presenters will have uh, 15 minutes to present. And then uh, we, we can have uh, uh, five minutes for uh, questions. Uh, uh, so to not uh, take uh, more of your time, uh, let's immediately give the floor to our first presenter, who happens to be uh, Felix Fassen, who will be talking about uh, dynamic uh, uh, location referencing in Inspire, something innovative, something really interesting, how to make cross-map uh, uh, referencing possible through uh, something that goes beyond linear referencing methods, which are already inside Inspire. So, Felix, please, the floor is all yours. Is this the device to... Uh, yes. To, uh, okay. Please, uh, Speak into the microphone. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Felix Vaassen. Uh, I'm the co-founder of a, a small startup in the Netherlands, which is called uh, Simacom. And um, our mission is to help organizations um, uh, and help them improve the availability, usability uh, um, of uh, geographical data. Because, um, as you see, it's still very hard to share data, which is geographical from nature uh, and, and that's what I want to share uh, with you uh, first before I start I have to make a confession uh, and that is that I'm not a um, how do you call that an inspire insider so I'm not really aware of uh, of all the working groups and all the efforts uh, which are already done um, however I think it's interesting we are actually really a user from inspire so I could say I'm a fan of inspire I, I use the data we use it in our products but in using it we come uh, we stumble upon some things, and one of them is location referencing. Um, just, a, just a quick head up, I think everybody uh, knows why uh, we see a lot of uh, um, developments in our world, a lot of social economical developments, which basically means that we are moving towards an economy which is more based on a collaborative model. So it becomes much more important um, to share data and being interoperable. This not only applies to a governmental uh, organizations, but also from a business perspective, um, you basically doing business in the 21st century, you need to be interoperable. That's that's just my my take on it. So it's very important uh, uh, to support that. Um, one of the um, uh, so one of these trends um, or these one of these trends is that uh, what you see is that you need to be able to share data and sharing data, especially geographical data, is hard. Uh, just to give you an interesting statistic, in the last two years we've generated more data than we have done in the complete history of our digital age. Um, and 80% of that uh, has location-based data. So location is a very important topic, I think. Um, another thing, um, a development I see, is that um, um, we see a lot of developments uh, coming where it is very important that data becomes usable. And one example of the self-driving car is that there's a lot of inspired data, which is very interesting for a self-driving car, because you need to know what kind of uh, formal and informal rules of the road. I mean, you know, you have these fantastic sensors who can do all kinds of advanced imagery, but um, we also have something like road authorities uh, having traffic measures uh, which are very dynamic in nature. So it's, you know, that's, I think, very important. Sadly, the reality is that this still happens. And uh, of course, this is a bit uh, exaggeration. Um, but what I want to illustrate with this is that stuck uh, or trucks still get stuck uh, in, under bridges. And why is that? I mean, probably this driver, assuming he was not drunk or blind or both, uh, um, has a navigation device with a map. Um, in the Netherlands, we have uh, an Inspire data set describing all road restrictions. So so practically all the information is digitally available, but why is it so hard to create applications using this data? 
The reason for that is that there are a lot of different maps and data sets. And I think uh, for the first time here, I'm in an audience who can understand this uh, because you're all working with Inspire. It's very complicated to work with different maps, different data sets, different methods of describing a location. This is very hard. Just to give you an overview of my reality, what, what my daily work looks like, we have a platform which, and this is only for the Netherlands, uh, where we have to process 250,000 road segments every second or every 30 seconds. And we have to use, we have cu customers using different maps because they just have a preference or they already invested heavily on systems which you know for 10 years been in development and they don't want to change maps because as you know if you change the map um, that becomes uh, uh, difficult so what i would like to show you is uh, one of the big challenges uh, i think in inspire is the way where we refer to a location or actually describe a location this is a practical example of an application we built where we can query the complete national geo register in the Netherlands and dynamically and automatically uh, load in Inspire data and couple that with uh, real-time traffic information. So this is a data set um, uh, describing that piece of road. Uh, is this the... Oh, cool. Uh, this piece of road. And it does that by referring to some kind of ID. So that's nice, but what kind of ID is that? Um, is it an ID to a map? Okay, yes, in this case it is. And it's a very specialized map we use in the Netherlands uh, for these kind of applications. So in order to become a useful data set, I think somebody in another country uh, who, or another business who's providing software for a customer, it is very hard to work with this data because he needs to have knowledge of a specialized map which is called in our country the NWB and in the previous presentations there were also some people who are in the transformation process have a very hard time uh, transforming transportation networks because you have to have this topology knowledge um, so the challenge is how do you exchange a location or a piece or a road uh, between bit different maps and data sets some people might say, yeah, you have WMS for that. You just layer on top of them. It's nice for visualization. But if you are doing advanced route planning or you're in the business of transport and logistics, you, you need to do route planning based on data sets. Like I want to route with only bridges which are lower than six meters or higher for that matter. Um, right? So that becomes very difficult to make such a thing and actually utilize something like that because you have to have uh, an infrastructure for that. Just to uh, not to have some kind of dissertation about uh, the, the definition of a location, but <clears throat> I think it's important to notice that a lot of people think that a location is just a coordinate. But in my view, a location is much more than that. A location is obviously a point or a line or an area, but it, it gets meaning when, uh, of course, you have to have a, uh, some kind of coordinate system. Then you know where the location on a body, in this case Earth is, um, but then you still don't have enough information because you don't know if it's a road or whether it's a waterway or all kinds of things. So basically the map provides the spatial context to your data set. So the map is really important. The map is not just a 2D, 2D rendering of an image. It's actually a very complex database which has points and lines and interconnections between those lines describing all the features you might need. Now, in order to do proper location exchange, if you describe a piece of road on uh, here, uh, for instance, a traffic jam or an incident, and you want the consumer of the data to have the same data, the ideal case would be that everybody uses the same map. But, I mean, <laughs> let's face it, that is not really a realistic scenario because there are different maps. This is just a case of one navigation provider um, having a lot of maps because not everybody updates its map or has a different version or an older device. So this also applies to, let's say, uh, Inspire or other things. Different maps introduce a lot of different problems. Uh, I'm not going to name them all, but um, they have different qualities. Uh, certain maps are used for authoritative reasons. So, for instance, missing driving direction. But if you want to make a route planner, you need to have driving direction because else it becomes very hard for a route planner to do something useful with that. 
So this is just a real world example of a piece of highway in the Netherlands, uh, just to show you difference in geometry, because maps are still made by people. There's a lot of automation already, but still, people are still involved in mapping maps. This is the same location. Uh, I don't know if you can see it properly. Um, if you download the slides, you will see it. But basically, here you see a exit or slip road, and the, the dot is the same location on uh, the map. And what is interesting is when you look further is that the, just the geometry of this exit has been drawn differently. So in the left case, the, the slip road uh, exits here and here it exits there. So if you have a data set describing a road closure and it uses a not very precise positioning like uh, absolute positioning, GPS, or maybe some other way, what are you actually saying if you are, are getting this information you have to use it on this map? In one case it might mean the whole road will be closed and another way it will only be the exit. So from a traffic or a logistical point of view this is very important to be that precise. Um, just another thing, um, maps do use different IDs for their segments and they also use different segmentation of a road. All road models or topologies, not only for roads but also for other transport networks, all use different segmentation. So this makes it very hard. So basically what I'm saying, functionally you want to have a relation with your topology, but technically you don't want it because it's unmanageable if you do it that way. So that's, I think, a big challenge in Inspire. And um, as our chair just said, Inspire already has a solution for that, which is called linear referencing. But linear referencing also has its disadvantages. Um, uh, now, this is what I just said. Uh, linear referencing allows you to map independently describe a location. However, uh, it relies on, a, on a, an arbitrary chosen points or lines. So the people who are choosing these points, also determining the quality of your positioning. If you have less points, <laughs> you're less precise. Another thing is that if you want to do this correctly, you need to have a predefined table which lists all these locations and it can only work if both sender and receiver use the same location or same table, which we all know in reality is not the case. So in that case you're losing data or you, ca you can't put it on the map. Um, just to just a linear referencing is, is just a functional way of describing how you do it and there, there are much different implementations and one of in our field is used as TMC is added to the Datex2 profile which is a uh, yeah, standard in Europe to, do, to describe traffic information um, and a TMC is nice but not all countries use TMC so there you go. What we are working with is called something uh, which is called dynamic location referencing. And the cool thing about dynamic location referencing is that you have all the advantages of linear referencing, but you don't have to use the tables and you can use your own map. So basically dynamic location referencing works as follows. It works with routing on a target map. So the map you're using to encode the location, so describe it or decode it. Basically it uses the short paths, uh, so this, uh, let, let us imagine you want to describe this route or this location. Um, you de determine the beginning point and the end point and it will use its shortest path to determine it. Of course, that's not the location we want to have. So we use some kind of intermediate points with some heuristics for the route planner to tell them uh, to come to the original location. The cool thing about this is that if you have described a certain topology, for instance for a road network, you can transform this or decode it on any map uh, and have it retained, even if the topology underneath it changes it because it uses route planning. It doesn't use any static way of describing a location. Of course, there are some pitfalls, as with all technology, so I'm not going to claim that this is the holy grail, but it's, I think, a good, uh, yeah, good, good point in a good direction. This is an example. You have one location which is encoded, you see at the left. I use a Google Maps just to give you an idea where it is, but it, we're actually talking about geometry, so not about the pictures. And here you see the location decoded on three different maps, and you notice that the red line has a different di geometry. Hence, this is great because I still have the original location and I'm able to decode it because it goes over the exit and probably the red map, which is a TomTom -tom map, has a different geometry for the exit. But I'm still able to keep the location without throwing it away. Uh, I think I mentioned all these things. Uh, I think the, 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 the nice thing about the dynamic location referencing is that it allows you to become free of your map 
but still, sorry, still be able to retain information about the topology, uh, which is very important for transport or transport or linked networks. Um, just to give you an example, just like TMC is an implementation of linear referencing, um, OpenLR is a technique for dynamic location referencing. It's open source. And just to show you that there are already a lot of progress on the way to get this more adopted. Um, it's already added to the Datix2 extension. It's used extensively in Sweden uh, and hopefully this year also in the Netherlands. Um, and there are also some standardization efforts around OpenLR within TISA and also within the ISO ITS workgroups. Uh, and basically that's what I want to do uh, for people who are working within Inspire. I would like to raise this to the intention. Maybe it's interesting to also have something in Inspire to support this because I think this will also tremendously help the transformation process, but also the usability of Inspire data. These are some differences between the linear and the dynamic one. I won't go uh, through them all. Um, but I think one thing is nice to mention is that if you have predefined tables, you're the you are dependent on the chosen network of this system. And so you're limited to the coverage of, of what, you, what you agreed upon. Dynamic uh, because dynamic referencing works inside the map itself, basically the only limitation about coverage is what you can do with your map. So this means, this might be trivial for you, but uh, it becomes much more important within the business community and also governments to address uh, lower classes networks. So not only highways, uh, uh, but uh, rural and urban roads, especially for transport planning. Uh, even the urban roads, they call it last mile truck guidance, is very important because that's where the real uh, incident happen, not on the highway. Uh, to conclude, um, dynamic location referencing provides, I think, a lot of functional and technical benefits uh, which help users uh, to reference locations um, and uh, really helps uh, having a more flexible way, not using one map standard or one data set, but use your own data, ma uh, your own maps and still being able to work with different data sets, so greatly improve the interoperability uh, um, and, and not having to rely on a certain map vendor. A lot of people are are caught up because they have chosen a certain map vendor, would like to move to other maps, and this is a way to do that. So, uh, to conclude, I think dynamic location referencing really could be a useful solution uh, to help uh, get Inspire data uh, being more used, because I think that's really what we're trying to do here. It's not adhering to some, of course it's adhering to a governmental standard and, and standards, but the real point of our work is that we want people to start using this data and create new innovative ways of, of, of using the data and get more knowledge about this. And that's what I think we try to accomplish with each other. And that should also be a bit more the focus, I think. So that's would I. Uh, that's that's my presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much, Felix, for the really interesting presentation. The floor is now open for for questions. Please. Uh, I was wondering. Can you hear it? Did I say? Would you please use the microphone for that? Um, um, the core of the dy dynamic uh, location reference is that what you say you, you're not using a map to to do your routing or your reference on. You you're using some uh, defined location or to uh, define your topology in the in the map or um, how 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 is your framework working when when you want to go from A to B? Uh, now actually we are using a map, but you don't need to have a specific map. So basically what we do is we have an, a very abstract way to describe a route in a topology and have all kinds of heuristics uh, which tell the route planner whether, uh, for instance, what the bearing of a line is or what the Hausendorf between two lines is to, to do this matching. This, this is all done by the, 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 uh, the location referencing. And that's the part of the encoding. So you use, for the encoding of a location, you will use a map, but it doesn't matter which one you use. You are free to choose your own map to do so. Obviously, it needs to be a map which supports route planning. If you have a map which doesn't support that, you can't use that map. Um, uh, chicken and egg kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Then for the 
decoding, um, you are also free to use your any any map you please to to reconstruct the original location on your target topology. So which could be completely different. To give you an example, in the Netherlands, the, the our road authority uses a, a commercial map provider, and they couple all their descriptions about road restrictions to the link IDs inside that map. And obviously, this is a very precise way of, to do it, but it's unmanageable because map providers do not a guarantee that this ID remains the same or even exists among updates. Updates. So you could use something like this in order to describe it map independently and still being able to decode it on any map. And I think this is very important for people who are um, creating data sets which has to be used by more more people because you can't, uh, as I said, some people have a certain preference for a certain map because of its quality or its attributes or its features. Uh, and this provides you a way of transcoding locations between maps without explicitly referring to them. Th th does that answer the yeah. question? So, okay. uh, in a way, you, you just you uh, kind of metadata for the topology exactly. Exactly. Of, of the map. And these kind of metadata and links you're able to transfer to any kind of uh, map who is topology uh, exactly. well defined. That's basically the, if you remember the slide with the yeah. dots, what, what we call that is location yeah. referencing points, mm. uh, which is an abstract way of uh, not only having this point, but also have enough information for the map matcher to correlate it to a, a line saying, right. if you have a point saying, but it should be at a line, point along a line, which has this bearing uh, and, and this functional road class, you can already very f fast find which, which route you need to have. This not only... No, I, I think uh, I get to the point. Okay, yeah. thanks. Thank you. Sorry, it's a bit complicated to explain. <laughs> Uh, hi, Michael Lutz, JRC. Um, sorry, I missed most of your talk, but maybe you have said that already. Um, but, but are you aware of the um, the work um, or the work that they're doing on ITS and around the ITS directive, where they try to attach um, real-time traffic information to roads? Yeah, actually, if you look at the uh, the ISO I mentioned in the last slide, uh, that is a, a CITS work, or actually an ITS working group. And it's also, if you look at draft, because especially corporative ITS is still in draft status, but they are also proposing OpenLR as a method uh, to do so because it's open source. There are other technologies like, uh, I think, Open ULR, but ULR is still mostly a functional description and not a real implementation which is used in the real world. So it's a nice, uh, um, and there's of course Algora C, which is also a, a dynamic location referencing method. But the problem of Algora C is that it's, uh, it's, a, it's licensing costs and it's very expensive to use. So not really nice for open data or stuff like that. No. One final question, anyone? Okay, I take the opportunity then. Uh, it's obvious that there is a huge uh, added value from using dynamic uh, location referencing for transportation networks. Have you tried something with, for instance, hydrological network or other linear topological uh, objects, which would also be very interesting for other domains, I think? It's a, it's a very, very good question. Um, um, we, ha we have done some, some trials with uh, railroads. Uh, however, railroads are in this sense a bit simpler because yeah I mean you have the two directions and um, yeah some so we really don't know how that would match up but we do have a lot of ideas about that so the, basically the answer is no but our ambition is yes <laughs> thank you okay thank you so, uh, next in our program, uh, we have uh, Heidi Van Pries, who will tell us something about an effective way to model, document, and generate output specific services. Uh, um, so this is a, a topic which very really well aligns with our plenary session in the morning. So my name is uh, Heidi Van Parijs. Um, I work at the Danish Geodata Agency and I would like to tell you something more about how at the Danish Geodata Agency we, uh, we model, we document and we distribute our data. This is our organization map. Um, 
I work in the unit called databases and standardization. And uh, one of the tasks we have there is to assist other units in, uh, in modeling their data and in distributing them. Um, I do this modeling work together with two other colleagues. A short uh, contents. Um, important to understand the way we're doing is things is uh, to have a look at our target architecture. What are we aiming at? Um, and then I will tell a bit about how we uh, distribute our data. We have um, something called the Danish Basic Data Initiative and we have also Inspire Elf. They both have a set of modeling rules inspired um, by one another or well the Danish rules are inspired by Inspire but they're not exactly the same. So how do we deal with this different kind of rules coming from different places? Um, this is our target architecture. I won't explain everything. I just want to highlight uh, one thing. That is that there's two different and separate lines for our production data and our distribution data. So the production data is indicated on the left. It's a cycle. Data is going out. People are updating it. We are maintaining the data and the changes are saved again in our data store for production data. Then on the right hand side we have again a data store for our distribution data. So data go from production to distribution, replicated or probably remodeled as well, and then they go out where they can be used by data consumption applications. Usually the schemas and production are more complex because it's a different purpose. It's for maintaining the data. We probably need more attributes to support whatever the business has to do. This is the overall process of how we model, document, generate different uh, services. So I will go uh, into each step uh, shortly. Um, so the first step is, well, creation of the models. We have in Denmark um, a vision that we want to have common data models. We uh, have taken a lot of ideas from Inspire, um, which is, well, we use UML models, we want to generate, at least in the Geodata Agency, we want to generate our uh, GML application schemas automatically. And we also really want to reuse what has been done before, so we reuse the data types from ESO, for instance. There's, of course, more things we have uh, taken inspiration from. There are some things that we do in a bit different way. Um, I listed some examples. One thing is that there are some pretty strict requirements on how we deal with uh, history of data. So we really want to use this concept of bi-temporal uh, bi temporal data. When did something happen? When did we knew it happened in the real world? We use a slightly different UML profile. Um, that's for different reasons. We want to add some tagged values. We want to store documentation in there. Um, we also have to think that it's not only geospatial data. We also want to model persons, businesses. They don't have a specific location. And we also uh, change some names um, of the stereotypes. We just prefix them. Another difference is that at least for the data we have been working with now, is that we don't use Inspire's data model directly. What I mean is that we don't inherit from it. Of course, we look at it. Again, we let us inspire by it. So often the structure will be similar, but we don't er inherit directly from it. And then the fourth difference is that we, we model in Danish. To help um, the people at our agency do the modeling, we um, extended enterprise architect a bit, so we made uh, an MDG technology, a model-driven generation technology. So uh, we have our special geodata diagrams, and when you open a diagram like that, then we'll have a toolbox that contains just um, UML elements we need for our models. So it's to help people that are not so familiar with modeling, to help them do the actual modeling. So we at databases and standardization don't have to do the whole thing ourselves. One thing we think is very important um, to remember when doing modeling is that UML diagrams, they have a really big communication value. Because that's, that's also what we see when, when we have meetings and people have printed the diagrams and that's the basis of, of our discussion. So we try to follow some common sense best practices, which is, for instance, less is more. So we'd rather have a couple of smaller diagrams that um, explain part of the model 
instead of just one big A0 diagram that has the whole model on it. That's not understandable. The next best practice is just tidy up, make sure that they look nice. It doesn't change the model, but it improves the communication. Something we started with as well is um, some automatic validation of UML models. Um, I displayed a list here of some ideas that we actually could implement. One example is that we want to make sure that we actually reuse data types that are already in the ESO models. Enterprise Architect, it's based on a, on a database, so we can query it, so we can make some validation queries. If there's no returns, well, that's, that's fine. Then there's no mistakes, at least on that aspect of the modeling. The next part is creation of uh, GML application schemas. We have a unit called uh, data distribution and they take care of what we call digital map supply or kortversuning in, in Danish. They have quite some experience with distributing data via web feature services to users. And therefore they have some principles. They say, well, we need a flat structure. We don't want any special Danish characters in our files because that's just too complicated URL encoding for our users. And we want to use uh, GML too because that's what most tools support. So I, I showed here a list um, of the applications we support at the, at the digital map supply. So of course, um, this gave us quite some headaches because there's a lot of standards telling you how to do things and it's very, very nice and fancy. You can do quite a lot of things, but we also have this principles that we actually want normal users, for instance, sitting at offices and municipalities, to be able to use our data, and we want to deliver them via a standard web feature service. So how did we solve this? Um, something that was really important for our unit databases and standardizations is that we follow the, the really basic principles of UML modeling and we really want to create our GML application schemas in an automatic way. Luckily, ShapeChains actually can do quite a lot of things and it contains this flattener functionality. I won't go into details, but I would like to show a few examples just to illustrate what does it mean to flatten a model. So this is a first kind of flattening. It's flattening of complex data types. Um, so we have a named place, it has an ID, and that ID, it actually has a complex data type because it consists of two parts, an ID of a namespace. Well, in ShapeChange, you can flatten that. So you have a flat structure with, well, it's, it calls its ID local ID, ID dot namespace. So it, it is made flat. There's no nested structure in my XML anymore. The next kind of flattening is um, multiplicity. Because often in the models you have a multiplicity that is unknown, it could be any number. But in practice you will actually usually have an idea of, well, what is the maximum number of names an in place can actually have? We can look in our systems, we have a lot of data, so we can look up some number and set a realistic maximum for that. And then again, um, the flatten can help so you don't have a lot of attributes or a lot of elements in the XML that are called name. No, you will have name underscore one, name underscore two. These are different names and that is something the regular GIS systems can do something with. They can display it. Then the third thing is, as I said, we don't want to have Danish characters, so we have to transliterate them. There's also functionality in ShapeChains that can tra transliterate names. We want to use GML2. Again, this is built in in ShapeChange. It's a matter of configuration. Something which causes quite some headaches and we didn't solve completely is what do we do with associations? How do we use this in our GML application schemas? What we actually, so this is an example of a municipality who belongs to a region. So it's, it's, it's modeled with an association. What we actually did here to to make the output in GML more user-friendly is we went back into the models and we actually added some attributes. We added the unique IDs of the region to the municipality. But we also indicated, well, this is actually a derived property. It comes actually from the reason this is why the slash is there. That's the UML, uh, UML thing. So in that way, when you go into the web feature service and you ask for a municipality, you will get the unique IDs for the region already there. 
of course we still have the link in uh, the GML application scheme and that's actually something we have to find out. What do we put in that link when we work with web feature services? So that's something we have to invest, uh, investigate later on. So by doing this flattening process, we can actually create um, GML information that can be read by, for instance, QGIS. And this is the aim we want, that regular users can use their systems they have been using before to read our data. Then in parallel with creating the GML application schemas, you need to create database schemas to hold this information. Shape chains can again be of help, but you still have to know you, you still need to have quite some knowledge about how to translate an object-oriented UML model into a relational database model. So our experience here is that shape changes can help to eliminate typos and, and column names, stuff like that, but when you have more complex models, then you, you do need to have this knowledge and you do need to do some manual modifications. So what we do is that um, our department, we work together with, a, well, it's in our department the database guys, so we just talk to them and cooperates about how should the schema look like. The next step is to map those production data into the distribution system. This is something that is usually be done in another unit, so I can't explain too much about this, but it's yeah, standard database tools they use to move the data around. And then when the GML application schemas are generated, when the data has been moved, then we can set up web feature services and the tool we use um, at the Geodata Agency, that's Scope Publisher. So again, here you see that uh, the moving from the production data to the distribution data is also something that is present in our target architecture. So that's why it makes sense to make the process in that way. So what's to say this? Well, this um, model-driven thing is kind of new, so we have used it on a few data sets. We have actually a service up and running for administrative units. Um, we have a model for named places uh, and are implementing the database schemas and we will st soon start moving the data. And we are working on models for topographic reference data and cadastral parcels. Um, our experience here is that the process I described before, it's an iterative process. Sometimes, well often, you need to go back to your models and think about, is this really how we want to distribute our data? Because it's not because you have the data that you have to distribute everything you have. What is it that makes sense for the user of our data? So where do Inspire and ELF come into the picture? Well, I talked about um, remodeling of data from production to distribution, but you can also uh, remodel data in your distribution system and model it into other distribution schemas. So this is what we plan to do um, in the future with, with our Inspire and ELF data. So we will remodel the data in the database so it has a more Inspire-like database schema. And then we will again uh, set up Inspire Web Feature Services with Go Publisher. Um, if you have been to some, other, to some of the other sessions, you will recognize this as the two-step approach for uh, delivering Inspire uh, compliant data. We have some Inspire data sets already, um, but the transformation was done using the older way, not the model-driven generation way. So what we'll do as well, how did we map before? Because there's a lot of business knowledge in there. Um, we'll use something that has been used in SDN and ELF. We'll fill out the matching table because that's a, t a tool to talk with the people in the business and to the people um, who actually have to implement the mapping. We will, as I said, make the schema transformation in the database and then we will set up the Inspire services. <coughs> Thank you for your attention. for this really interesting presentation. Floor is open for questions. Hi. Uh, I miss your first uh, way to, to flatten the models. So if you can... Like the first it. example? Yeah. Yes. It's a flattening of complex data types. Um, because if, if you would not flatten, then you would get an XML hierarchy, and this is what 
usual uh, regular GIS system can't uh, can't read. Well, maybe some of them, but not all of them. Yeah. Other questions? Could you go to one of the last slides where you mentioned remodeling to according to distribution? Uh, here. Uh, just want to hear more about what do you actually mean? Uh, the data can be remote, remodeled according to the distribution. Does that mean that the source data is? basically split or combined according, for example, Inspire data schema or something else? Yeah, so we have one source of data, which is the production data. Uh, we also call it the master data at our agency. And those data can be remodeled to be more fit for purses, uh, for purpose. So it's the same data, but to remodel it. And uh, technology could be that you create views on the data in the database. It's database views, materialized views, for instance. Yeah. One last question. Uh, if I can also take the opportunity. Uh, flattening the, the, the file, is the, the GML is a really interesting example. But have you got any experience with bringing it back the complex structure once it is flattened. Can, can you do that, deflatten it? Because I agree completely with you, uh, adding it to a QGIS or any uh, GIS software solution really needs a flat structure, but then through that we actually lose, for instance, Inspire compliance. So uh, can this be reverted back? Well, yes. You can, you can make rules for how you convert back. Um, but what was important for us here is how do we do it in an automatic way? Yeah. Yes, but it, it, it is possible. Thank you. So our next speaker is Alberto Bellusi, who will tell us uh, uh, details about IDMB, which is not to be confused with the Image Movie Database. So it is actually a uh, inspired data models uh, and generating inspired SQL scripts and WFS configuration instrument. So Alberto, please, the floor is yours. Uh, so, hi everybody, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Alberto Bellucci from the University of Verona. And uh, I will present this uh, tool, uh, which is called uh, Inspire Data Model Tool, uh, which is uh, a software for navigating the Inspire Data Model and generating uh, an Inspire SQL database. And also to configure, to configure uh, the uh, WFS uh, uh, service uh, in degree. So, uh, this work was carried out in cooperation with uh, uh, Politecnico di Milano and uh, is uh, maybe an answer to the previous uh, uh, questions of having uh, an automatic generation of the, uh, a database from the Inspire specification and uh, also to have automatically uh, the configuration of the WFS. Uh, obviously, we choose uh, instance of the, this. Uh, software of these technology, which shows uh, postgis and degree, but uh, you can do more or less the same things with other uh, uh, software. So here is the outline of my presentation. First, uh, I will uh, uh, explain the reference uh, context uh, that lead us to the introduction of these uh, tools and also the motivation. And uh, uh, first, I want to remark uh, the fact that we start from the UML uh, data models, which are indeed uh, the uh, only uh, things that is there in the Inspire regulation, since the encoding is just a plus but can be changed in the future. Uh, then I will uh, talk about the general uh, um, architecture of these uh, uh, tools. Uh, in this moment we have the um, data model browser, uh, the SQL mapper, and the WFS uh, configurator for uh, um, degree, as I said. 
Then I will talk a little bit about the rules that we apply when we uh, produce automatically uh, the SQL uh, uh, scripts uh, and uh, the WFS uh, um, configuration, and finally conclusion in future work. So which is the starting point? The starting point is that uh, the inspired specifications have to be implemented by member states uh, uh, within some strict deadlines. And in many countries, and particularly in Italy, uh, we have many data in spatial databases. So we have to start from uh, this special databases uh, in order to produce uh, what is required by Inspire. Uh, moreover, the solution uh, uh, that is suggested by Inspire people uh, is uh, uh, to use uh, the uh, web feature services uh, that produce uh, uh, GML streams. Um, let me say, I want to stress the fact that uh, uh, WFS uh, are, uh, is a technology for, pro, uh, for answering queries, okay? So uh, if now we are using it only to download data, it's just uh, a little, uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, uh, operation that we can ask to this software. It, it can do much more, and, and we'll be uh, able to do this, uh, for example, for applications uh, on mobile, uh, phones that can uh, somehow uh, only uh, not download all the database but just uh, uh, the piece of information that is necessary to show to the user in, the, in that moment. So um, this is just to remark the fact that we want to uh, propose an architecture that uh, is uh, um, I mean designed for this uh, target. So uh, our reference contest is this. We start with a set of spatial databases. We want to uh, build on them the uh, WFS uh, technology. We want uh, on the client side uh, to query this WFS uh, uh, services and we get the Gmail uh, as a, a response to our request. And uh, the building blocks of this own overall architecture is uh, the couple of uh, technology uh, databases on one side and WFS on the other one. So when we think about how we can build this, uh, this couple of uh, uh, blocks uh, that uh, are so important, uh, we start with two considerations. First of all, uh, uh, we say that the database uh, uh, should be there uh, because uh, to answer inquiries, uh, this is the current and I think uh, uh, most uh, reliable technology. And then uh, we have to start uh, uh, the design of the uh, database, not from the, uh, the target, uh, but from the source of uh, the specification somehow, which is uh, the UML model because the UML model describes the semantics of the data, the, uh, the structure, and uh, then you can encode the, uh, the data, the information, in uh, different ways, uh, with different purposes. For example, as we, we, we see in the previous presentation, that uh, for a, a current JS yes, software, having nested uh, tags is a problem, so you can uh, flatten the, uh, the GML. But, it, but the information that is represented there is the same. You just have a syntactic difference. Okay. So our motivations uh, uh, are uh, remarked in these slides. Uh, as I said, we want that uh, the WFS service uh, has a database, uh, a DBMS, uh, under the scene for uh, several motivations uh, for uh, uh, answering queries, uh, since the amount of data is very large, uh, since uh, we potentially have to deal with uh, uh, transactions and update of data uh, using the WFS. Second motivation, uh, uh, we also observe that the UML models should be more stable res with respect to the encodings. So starting from uh, the UML uh, could be more uh, uh, safe uh, since you don't want to redo the same things more, more time. Okay. So the third motivation uh, is uh, um, linked to this observation, uh, since uh, uh, if uh, we start from the production database uh, uh, and uh, we uh, transform it uh, uh, to, uh, in a way, so that the data can be loaded 
in the Inspire database, then you can also change the encodings, but your information is uh, already uh, represented uh, uh, as an Inspire data, and so you can do it very, in a very easy way. So the, if the transformation is between databases, uh, this will safeguard the investments you made from uh, changes in the encodings. Okay. So uh, here is the architecture of this tool, uh, which is a free tool uh, and will be available uh, in the next days on our website. Uh, sorry, I, I, I hope to be here and announce that the, uh, the tool is uh, ready, and it is, but we have problems with the server, uh, uh, the web server in Milan. Uh, it was a problem, technical problem, and now it is not available, but it will be in the next few days. Uh, so um, the Inspire Data Models uh, tools uh, has, uh, as I said, a model browser, which is uh, preloaded with the Annex 1, and uh, it has uh, an SQL mapper that can produce uh, the Inspire database in PostGIS, and has uh, a uh, WFS configurator so that you can uh, configure automatically uh, the WFS on the Inspire database, and you can produce, out then if you fill, if you uh, feed the database with data, then you get your GML if you made a request to the WFS. So, uh, as I said, the model browser uh, provides a way of exploring uh, the conceptual uh, uh, data model, um, which is the UML data model, uh, in a hypertest style. Um, it is uh, somehow a flattened mode, uh, because um, uh, for each class uh, you can see all the properties that are there. Uh, the direct properties, but also the inherited properties. Uh, and so it's a way of uh, navigating in the specification, the SPAR specification, without knowing uh, anything about UML. Uh, just knowing that there are some objects with structures that uh, have been modeled by uh, the Ins Inspire specification. Uh, the mapper uh, allows you to select. You can also select a subset of the feature types and produce a database for this subset. Of course, you can uh, lose something because you don't have all the feature types. But uh, uh, you can uh, produce uh, small databases also for the, the, the piece of information that you want to model with Inspire. And uh, uh, the same for the WFS configurator, of course, uh, uh, you select the feature types and then you produce the SQL script and uh, the XML file that configure the uh, degree, the degree um, the server. Uh, it was difficult to come out with this, uh, uh, with this uh, configurator because we have uh, uh, not only to consider all the uh, specification of Inspire but also the ISO specification, of course, because at some point uh, the uh, attributes of the classes uh, in uh, the uh, Inspire uh, data models go to uh, use types of uh, the uh, ISO package. So uh, you have to go to consider the uh, XST of ISO, which defines the encoding. So it's a really a mess. Anyway, we <laughs> arrive at the end, so now uh, should be correctly <laughs> configured everything. Uh, we preloaded uh, uh, the data model uh, because we have also a loader that is able uh, to um, load an EAP file uh, of Enterprise Architect. We loaded uh, the, uh, the file of uh, 2010, but now in a few weeks we will uh, do it uh, um, the same loading for the new uh, e e uh, IAP uh, for, uh, um, for the new uh, for the new version. And also uh, we will uh, load uh, the Annex 2 and Annex 3. Um, so new version of the of the tool will be dedicated also to those other uh, uh specification. Uh, we have to correct something uh, uh, in the EAP. Um, in particular, we have to simplify the ISO package. So we select some uh, types uh, of ISO, uh, the one that was used by Annex 1. Uh, and we have to uh, correct some errors, because there were some errors in the EAP. Um, so that's why we publish also this uh, file that we uh, correct and uh, uh, used, uh, so you can see it in Enterprise Architect. If you want, you can download from our from our site. 
Um, the, for the inspired database, as I said, I can give you some, some uh, very short uh, comments about our uh, mapping rules. We want to support, uh, of course, the implementation of WFS uh, for special data having complex structures like Inspire. We want to guarantee the satisfaction of the integrity constraints in the database for ensuring high quality of data. We want to um, possibly improve the performance of spatial queries and X-Link navigation. Uh, we want to uh, uh, let the database uh, be able uh, uh, to uh, also have incoming data uh, with the WFS uh, transactional. Maybe we would like to be a, a reference implementation for <laughs> Inspire. And uh, so we implement um, uh, some of these um, requirements in this way. We introduce primary keys, foreign key constraints, cardinality constraints. We have views that allows you to obtain all the objects that are the extent of a superclass in hierarchy and not only the, the members. Uh, we uh, choose the right uh, uh, geometric domains uh, uh, also according uh, uh, to uh, the correct uh, coordinate dimension uh, that the user has chosen. We introduce special indexes we uh, implement uh, uh, with no redundancy the uh, representation in the database uh, of uh, a role and its inverse because if you use for example the database that is produced by degree you have the implementation of the role and its inverse uh, in uh, 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 twice and in a, not in a, in a correct way. Anyway, here is some snapshot from my uh, from this uh, tool. On the left, you have the browser. On the right, the mapper. Uh, the browser allows you to browse uh, in the list of the classes in different ways, starting from the complete uh, package only considering uh, um, the application schema or on the flat list of uh, uh, the classes. You can choose a class and then you can see here the list of the properties of the class um, in a very easy way. Of course, uh, uh, there is a guide uh, uh, for uh, understanding exactly all the symbols and the labels that are there. Um, for example, here you see the railway road, you see the description, and there you see in blue the direct properties and uh, in yellow the uh, inherited properties. You have D for the data type, uh, an attribute that has a data type as type, G for, the, for a geometric attribute, R for a role. Uh, you, here you can see that you can have simple type, attribute with structure, data type. You can have role hidden in a data type uh, uh, that you can see here. You can have also the fact that data types uh, belongs to a hierarchy, so you have alternative uh, uh, possible representation of the value of the of the uh, of the attribute uh, due to this uh, hierarchy, and this is the alternative possible extensions. You have also other windows that shows you all the types of property. Also, the for example, the roles. Here you can see that there is a role uh, uh, network. Uh, network ref element that is uh, uh, shown here but is a hidden role you 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 will not uh, be able to see it if you don't open the the data type over there and this is the screenshot for the mapper. You choose a, a subset of the classes. You generate the script files. You just have to, to give a name to the DB specification to specify the uh, coordinate reference systems. Uh, you want to do 3D and some other information in other windows. And you uh, produce the, the file. Future work, uh, we are looking for uh, stakeholders which are interested uh, uh, to use this, uh, this tool. Um, we can propose uh, as possible extensions uh, a tool for validating uh, the Inspire Data Model. When we load, uh, we do some check. So we can give a report uh, on the uh, things that uh, were not uh, correct uh, with respect to UML uh, rules, but also to the uh, generic conceptual model rules. And uh, we also want to support the uh, transformation of data from one database to the Inspire database. We are doing this work for uh, the Italian uh, regions. Um, and that's uh, almost uh, the end. Um, I thought I could tell you that you can uh, download the tool from the special DB group 
uh, site, but if you now go there, there's a page that says um, under construction or some problems that there are, because as I said, we have some problems. But I mean, in a few days, um, uh, the, the tool will be there with all the instructions. And if you want, I have it here. So you want to see it, I have it on my uh, laptop. And you can also, I mean, copy it if you want uh, to use it. It's a Java application. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Alberto. Really interesting, and that would be really useful for those who want to implement using open source technology as a da database uh, behind. So, questions, please. Some of us do not use directly Inspy application schema, but we make some extension. For instance, in the Elf project, uh, does uh, you tool, uh, do you tool deal with this uh, extended profile? Uh, well, you, you, you mean that you have modified the UML data models? If you have modified them, you we can... Have, uh, we generally inherit uh, the Inspire model and make extension. Ah, okay. We so don't make modification in the Inspire model itself. It's extension. Ah, okay, okay. Yes, uh, well, if you have uh, uh, any... AP uh, file, I mean uh, uh, enterprise architect format uh, of those extended models, uh, you can send us uh, and you can, we can load it uh, inside the, the tool and we can uh, give you our tool uh, uh, with uh, the new schema loaded in. If you uh, don't do something particularly complex, uh, I hope that we can load it uh, with, no, with no problem. We will do the same things for Annex 2 and, and 3. Uh, so it is possible if uh, you have any AP file. One final question. One final question. Anyone? Let's thank Alberto once again then. Thank you. And invite our last speaker for this session, who is uh, Pardeplas Bjorn, who will uh, be speaking about the Danish basic data model, something that has been mentioned many times during the past several days. Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, my name is Pierre de Plas Bjorn. Uh, I've got a position at the, um, the Danish Ministry of Finance, more specifically at the, um, the, the Agency of Digitization, and, and, and there I'm working with the, this basic data project. Uh, I have to start up with uh, uh, thanking you very much for staying uh, on for this very late presentation, and um, also I, I have to ask you to bear with me this being much less technical than what we've been seeing um, in, in the in the near past, so 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 probably um, I hope you can cope with that. What I also hope is that you've been um, paying attention at the start of the day. My boss Jens Kriegerøen gave a presentation on the Danish um, basic data project, which I'm not going to be covering in from top to bottom with all the um, implications on on business cases and uh, goals and, and stuff. I'm going to talk about the, the common data modeling part of the project. So I'm going to give just uh -huh. a very brief introduction to the pro program. I've got to turn a bit. Um, what we have is an effort to model not just geospatial information, but, but the information on, on a number of, of, of different um, data domains where we're dealing with businesses, individuals, with, with, uh, with, with the real property addresses and, and maps, of course, are inspire relevant data. We are, um, we're dealing, this is part of, yeah. we're dealing with the, um, with, with the central databases of, of the, the Danish central administration and, and the, um, the goal here is to make everything available in a structured and uniform way so that just uh, similar to the Inspire project, all data will be available in, in, a, in a structured and harmonized way so, so that everybody can use it and, and that has all those um, efficiency and, and, and um, growth properties that, that were talked about earlier. Um, so what do we do? 
what we do in in a uh, in, in very brief uh, description description is that we have a series of, of uh, basic data registries that would be the registry of, of, of persons, registry of businesses and so on. Those are all um, transported into the data distributor which is where um, the, the users then would, would get access and of course also the, um, the basic data registers in some ways would be using data from the, the, the data distribut distributor. Um, in order to have an efficient um, deployment of data from in this end, you have to have a common model in a common model in a way that that everybody but should be able to to see the data in in one view, even though they come from from different sources. Everybody should be able to to see it in in in, in the same co um, composition. Um, on the other hand, we have the the paradigm that that data should be modeled at the at the source. Everybody owning the data should should still be the responsible for the modeling of the data. So, how do we make these data coming from 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 ah I've got an animation there? How would we we make that uh, work with with data coming from 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 different areas from here from there from there, and and, and ensuring that the data is sort of one data model not a number of different data models. That is the goal of the project I'm going to try to explain about. Um, so that we'll be ending up with the basic data model. Um, actually, it's the basic data data model. Um, but <laughs> it's probably going to be a bit confusing, so I'm going to stick with the basic data model. Not that it makes it anyhow basic. Um, of course, there is um, there's, a, there's a focus on the UML modeling of, of stuff, um, and of course there would be what I uh, I'd like to envision like this: um, the the concept modeling, what is less specific than than the UML modeling, and of, also of course we have data models that are uh, data representations in in you in. Um, in XML, GML, uh, JSON, whatever kind of, of data representation that the user would like, but but our focus is on on the, the central uh, logical data model and uh, as a US, UML class model. Um, so what should the users be have be getting from from the, the the basic data model? They should have sort of a content description. Which are the basic data? They should be able to see all basic data in, in, uh, in as I said, one view. They, they sh there should be a uniform representation of those data so that um, you could build services that have a certain um, degree of uniformity. And again, this is the presentation model, meaning this is the, the user-directed view on the, on the model. It's not the, the database model. It's, it's not the internal model of, of the data distributor. It's, it's what the users are going to see. So how do we do that? How do we accomplish that uh, different organizations do uh, simultaneous modeling that should then be represented as, as one coherent model? Well, we put on, out a, a number of rules on how to put together uh, the model. Actually, I, I think that my, my boss called it the cookbook of modeling, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm a bit um, uncomfortable with that because <laughs> Actually, we, we are we're focusing on the product. We are focusing on the model. How should it be? Not show, not on how should it be made. That's up to to the to the data users to devise their own process for for modeling. We're focusing on the product that they deliver to the to central instance. Um, so, what we ha have are our rules for. Um, how should the model be be composed? What is should it contain? Of course, that will have some implementation implications on how uh, which data are to be stored in in the registers. But but that's um, well what they they they'll got to got to understand then when they read the read the rules. Um, for the rules that we set up, we've of course been looking around, especially at, at the um, at the the Inspire uh, common model documentation. We use ISO types. We we use UML as a, as a modeling language, of course. Um, we also have a, a number of, of Danish projects that have uh, some best practice that we've been incorporating, trying to keep um, not too much uh, discrepancy between the, the 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 Inspire way of doing things and and, and the the more uh, local Danish thing, ways to do things. 
Um, some of the rules on the more overall representation is that, of course, you have to reuse data classes. If you're the modeler of the person application schema, you should not be the one setting up addresses. The, um, the address authority should be setting up the, the address model, and, and then the person modeler should be, uh, simply re refer the address model. And of course, everybody should use the ISO types so that we have no overlap in, in modeling. There's only one representation of the person object in the model. We're going to be uh, be documenting the uh, the semantics of, of the classes as as tagged values inside the model, so that they can be be easily extracted from the model and then used in in in, um, in registries and and and, and catalogs. Um, we have a number of of, of uh, common properties, and this is where I could become a little bit technical. But I think I'll skip that actually. But but we we do require that that everything has a persistent ID. Uh, we require it to be modeled as an HTTP URI. Um, everything should be modeled with an explicit status, meaning that, for instance, a building can be planned under construction, uh, in use, torn down. Um, that is something that you would probably be be able to uh, to discern when you do a data analysis. You see which which steps have been going through and what where is the data, and then you you, you could come up with an image on, on what kind of building is it. But we think that users would um, users would prefer to have an explicit state for for all objects. Um, there's a strong focus focus on bitemporality as we have a um, administration. Um, obligation to be able to, as, as Heidi explained it also, to be able to tell the users what did the administration know at what, what time, when did we know it, and what did we know, what was true and which at which point of time. We have a strong focus for the same reasons on who did the, this. Um, we have to point at the agents that put in the data and maybe also the agents that, that were responsible for the change in data. And we have a focus on event-driven architecture, so that um, hopefully all these data changes would be um, could could be uh, put out as, as messages in in a, in, a, in a very loosely cobbled um, architecture. The grand vision is to have all those models available as as UML packages in. Um, in a, in a subversion registry in the center, a, a registry where the, the data modelers could be putting in uh, their models, they could be taken out and modifying the models and, and uh, updating in the in the registry. This is from where we would we would be making the uh, the, the web pre, uh, representation of the model. This is where um, application developers would see the model and, and incorporate it in their own uh, development tools. And uh, as as um, as, as the, the dream, <laughs> say, we, we, we would want to have all the data delivery be, being based on the model in, so that um, we would like uh, a serv data service uh, development tool to be able to read the model, the, the, the service user be enabled to, to use the object from the model and then via a number of transformation rules actually put out schemas for, for the data uh, that uh, should be in, in those services. Um, we're not really there. Um, <clears throat> this is the, the model repository at the moment. Um, <laughs> but, but we have dreams, okay? Um, also, we have a website. It says there's going to be some models, data models, that is. Um, um, then, uh, actually, what we do have is that uh, we have uh, have been working with a Nord Norwegian trans uh, consultancy in order to build um, a model broker or model transform model transformation uh, tool, something similar to to shape change. But this one is focused on on RDF models. We have an idea that we might be. Um, be enabling communication between different modeling uh, languages in, in that we make a core model which is an RDF OWL representation of the UML which should be then tra uh, translatable to other modeling to modeling languages and to, um, to the XML. Um, and we are, we are looking into ways to, to make that operational. So, um, that was about the rules, of course. We could also um, say, uh, how, 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 do we, how do we manage to have the, the, the um, 
uh, how about all the the, the changes in in in, uh, in standards? How the, the sta changes in uh, in services and how how would we um, manage all those changes in in uh, in, uh, in common with the model? And, and it could be something like this. I, I hope that it would be more like we have set up three um, governing bodies for for the uh, for the model. We have uh, the the broad basic data board that has the ownership of the of the model should ensure that it's useful. Uh, or, or rather, they should ensure that it's there. We have the model steering group that ensures the um, the quality that it's actually useful, and then we have where uh, things really hit the fan is, is the um, the model forum that should be um, conducting the peer review of, of the model. They should be the ones actually when we have a new model coming in, saying for the services that we are envisioning on, on this overall system there should be this and that object that we could refer in that way and 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 everything should be in, in harmony there so so that's going to be a, a fairly complex process uh, ensuring that that the models that come into the central re uh, registry actually have the qualities that are used so that they're useful for for all the um, the different users of the model that's about it, actually. I, I put out some in in the presentation. If, if you're going to go download it later on, there's a, um, a number of of, um, of, of um, websites. Some most of them, of course, in Danish, um, but at least they, it's got nice pictures and stuff. Uh, and, and 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 some some of them doesn't really have anything at all. Um, that's it. Thanks a lot, uh, Per, for this interesting presentation. Questions or comments? Michael? Thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks for a very interesting uh, presentation. I think you're doing a lot of stuff that might be quite relevant for Inspire in the in the broader context of Inspire. So, uh, in the other way around, I actually thought that Inspire was doing a lot of things that I, I, I could download and use. <laughs> Good. Um, my question is basically, um, do you, have you produced any tools that might be useful for the wider community, or do you have any guidelines in English as well, not just Danish? <laughs> That, that we might well, uh, be reusing as well, especially around the model management and um, and discussion around the data models and so on. It'd be very interesting. The model rules that I've been hinting to are being translated, I hope, into English and will be available, of course, then from from our website. Um, the tool that that I, I hinted at the um, the RDF conversion tool is is clearly something that we'd be sharing with with uh, with anybody who wants them if, as as soon as they're sort of packaged and ready. Yes. Other questions or comments? If I, if you allow one question from me, then uh, the model rules are something really, really useful, I mean, and that's a great news that they're being translated in English. But have you done some training for, for for the data providers? Because communicating such matter is really, really a challenging thing, I think. Uh, and then, if there is a training program, how have you handled that, and how extensive is it? This is also relevant uh, in the broader context. Yeah, of yeah, Inspire. sure. Um, we have been doing a little bit of training. Um, we had one session. With a with a consultant from Sparks Industries coming from Austria to, to, to give give training, but that was more basic enterprise and architect stuff than, than actually using the the, um, the the model rules and then doing. Um, we are planning to have a, a base project file, an EAP file, which have all the uh, the basic um, entities and, and stereotypes uh, as a starting point, and then we'll set up trainings. And, and I'll, I'm ha very happy to to go to to those people that that need the, some help with it. Yes. Thank you. It's the time for the end of our session uh, is already uh, arrived. Uh, I would like to thank you all for, for, for being here now and most of all to our four outstanding speakers. Let's, let's give them a big thank you once again.